Um, again, when he gets back home to North Africa, he writes the Confessions to um, characterize his relationship to this woman as merely a matter of sexual addiction uh, and to repudiate the relationship so that he can be elected as a bishop uh, because she was from the same hometown and that's where he's now back to in the same area. Um, when I continued to read through the history of moral theology, of course, one of the most captivating parts of it is when you're writing about Alphonsus Liguri, uh, whom you obviously love very much. Um, and the thing that you emphasized was what I see as the mediation of grace, namely his uh, pastoral sense, his, his desire not to burden the lady unduly with um, expectations and constraints and penances. And you said at the end of the period of high casuistry, the result was standardization, especially around sexual ethics. Like that was an obsessive concern through the history of uh, moral theology. And the standardization was about control. Okay, these are the clear expectations and the penalties. That you have Henry Davis saying that young girls who aren't dressed modestly enough will be excommunicated, excommunicated, right? So it was really about social control. And then in the modern period, you go, you know, I'm thinking of Vatican II, I'm thinking especially of Humanae Vitae, and uh, people were no longer willing to accept the system of control and started to be more disruptive. And you have James Allison asking, you know, not only does, you know, does the church teach it as one question, is it true is another question. So people were asking that more. And then, of course, you go uh, to, in the, modern period, Margaret Farley, Mary Emil Panay, and you wind up in your book with the globalization of moral theology. You mentioned a lot of women writing from the global context and others. So um, the, the problem that I think we arrive at, and it's both an opportunity but a challenge as well, I think, is that we now have a vast decentralization and democratization and also pluralism of voices in, in Christian ethics and moral theology. And I think the challenge is to discern how to mediate among all those differences, right? Because again, structures of sin and structures of grace are both still present. The structures of sin haven't gone away just because we have pluralism. So we celebrate the pluralism, but what are the challenges that we still have? Not new, but in a different shape. Thank you, Lisa. Yep. It's always a mistake to go after Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pick where I was sitting. Lisa, in fact, I did, and then Lisa sat there. <laughs> Sorry. I wouldn't worry. Um, so in my brief comments, you know, it's just wonderful to be here, to be talking about Jim's book. I mean, Jim was my dissertation director, and we've had a friendship now for over 20 years. And I encountered this material for the first time in his fundamental world class. And now I'm teaching the book in mine. Katie and others. So it's a real, this is really a, a pleasure to be here today. So in my brief comments, I'll focus on a number of key contributions that the book makes to the field in, in general. First, Jim begins with Jesus in the New Testament, which should not surprise us in a way, but all too often is not the case. It can be, it's not the rule, but the exception to the rule when we talk about moral theology. And right off the bat, he offers an evaluative principle that Catholic moral theology should be judged in light of the message and witness of Jesus Christ that the best and truest expression of Catholic morality reflects Jesus' message and witness, which should always hold the center position, according to Jim. I think lay persons, theologians, bishops, popes, would do well to recognize and implement this orienting uh, principle. The centrality of Jesus leads to what I consider to be the most important contribution of the book of the Jesus provides a key corrective in the developmental narrative of Catholic moral theology in arguing that the pursuit of holiness in witnessing to one's faith in Jesus Christ through the living of charity and has been a perennial concern for Catholics. He corrects, uh, here he rightly corrects John Mahoney's widely accepted claim that the moral tradition emerges from <coughs> preoccupation with sin. And Jim's kind of overturning this a widely accepted claim. Importantly, Jim demonstrates where in the tradition we find the pursuit of holiness. I think this is a key contribution. He writes extensively on the works of mercy, which, if you follow Jim's career, has been a perennial concern of Jim's, um, as well as on moral striving and spiritual growth. I remember when I took fundamental moral theology, Jim talked a lot about moral striving, which I had never heard 
put in that kind of way, and, and I think that is a, it's a really helpful way to think about our moral lives. Um, so I recall Lisa recently making a comment about Sean, about your paper in the Doctrine of Colloquium, because this gets to this, this very point. When you wrote a paper about confraternities, and Lisa said, the confraternities are those late, cool. yeah, <laughs> that's right, <really bad. laughs> that, um, that the confraternities are these lay organizations that, that really facilitate moral and spiritual growth of the lady. And they really flourish in the 16th century. And Lisa said, no one writes about the confraternities except Jim. And there's a truth there. Jim has been writing about this for a long time and showing us, and Sean rightly doing this as well, that, that Catholics have always been focused on charity. Christians have always had this concern in fostering our relationship with God and neighbor and doing so in ways that are not individualistic, but rather in community, that we, we, we strive together, not alone. Um, and that really comes through, I think, in the book. I think, you know, and this is really what makes the book so unique. It provides this alternative account of how the tradition developed and what constitutes the core of the tradition. Um, you know, the academic contribution of the book is obvious if you've read the book. I mean, it's incredibly, you know, there's 298 footnotes in one chapter, I think, so. I mean, that's, this is, it's astounding. It's astounding. But I think Jim's work here also has the capacity to inspire Catholics. So I'll give you an example. So in my virtue ethics class the other day, we were discussing schools of virtue. We had just read McIntyre's After Virtue. We were reading the rule of St. Benedict. He ends After Virtue with, with an appeal to St. Benedict. Uh, and having just read Jim's book, I immediately made the connection of this kind of school of virtues approach to, uh, to the confraternities as, a, as an instantiation of the school of virtue. And so this generated this incredible conversation among the class about the need for schools of virtue that look like the confraternities, decidedly different schools than, than the confraternities. But do we have these? We have schools for in the intellectual life, Boston College. We have schools for, for athletics, for music. Do we have those schools for virtue? Uh, and I think this kind of spurred in the students this desire to investigate this further. So I, I see this as an academic work that also kindles our moral imaginations, which is a rarity, I think, uh, in, in, in academic writing. So I also have to mention Chapter 8, which Lisa just, just referenced, which really takes up the, the emergence of the Global Guild of Moral Theologians. And when I read this chapter, I said, this is a chapter that only Jim could write. Only Jim could write. I've never read anything comparable to this chapter. His experience in founding and running the CTEWC put him in contact with theologians from throughout the globe, more so than I think any other Catholic ethicist. In fact, Jim's work at CTEWC was instrumental in providing a global platform for these scholars from uh, traditionally ignored places in the world. Uh, so I consider the whole book to be required reading for anyone in, interested in theological ethics, but especially chapter eight, especially chapter eight. <laughs> Never again can a scholar from the global north honestly claim that there's a dearth of scholarship from the global south. You can't do it if you read the book. <clears throat> For example, chapter 8 has at least 60 footnotes, at least 60, dedicated to the works of African theologians. If you're looking for works on, in moral theology from African theologians, you've got a reference text right here. Um, <coughs> never again can <coughs> scholars claim that theological ethics is an exclusively Euro-American enterprise. We see the deep and interesting contributions that are being made from outside of that context. So Jim's book really does understand Catholic theological ethics as an expression of a global church, and that the direction of Catholic, 21st century Catholic ethics is already profoundly influenced by scholars from the global south. You know, the final point here is I think Jim really has this finger on the pulse, pulse of where Catholic theological ethics has been, where it is, and even where it's going. I mean, this is a book of history, but I see him you know, pointing us forward in addition. Um, and he has a really unique capacity in this book to understand the details and also the larger picture. Um, and, and I'll give you just a couple of examples. You know, he provides in the text a really insightful synopsis of post-Vatican II moral theology as a turn toward suffering. You know, it's, it's kind of clear, I suppose, when you look at what people are writing, but to have it put in that way, I mean, to really be able to kind of, you know, Conceptualize that, I think, is a real contribution. And this is, as Jim notes, nearly absent from the moral manual tradition, right? And suffering doesn't show up as a, as a real concern. 
Later, Jim rightly contends that when married women and men, and the lady enter the, the, the discourse and they write about sexual ethics, they focus less on sexual organs and more on relationality and family. Again, looking at the breadth of the scholarship and saying this is really where the lay theologian is, is focusing her attention. Uh, and in, in order to make that point, he actually cites a number of books that Lisa has written. Um, so the book is, is, is a considerable achievement, and I think it's going to be, it is, and will continue to be an invaluable resource for students of theological ethics, scholars of theological ethics, for decades to come. So, well done, John. Thank you. Okay. So before coming to the STM, I was a fourth grade teacher at a small Catholic school in Minneapolis, and my student's favorite question was, why? And my class was fourth grade moral theology. That was how to live a moral life. Um, and so kids every day would say, like, why do we need to follow the Beatitudes? Why, do, why does Jesus say to love those who hate us? Why does Jesus care if I'm mean to my brother? And as I was trying to answer all of these whys, um, I found myself brushing up against these limits of my own understanding of the moral teaching of the church and how it's evolved. There were only so many times or ways that I could say, because the Bible says so, or because church says so. Um, and I simultaneously was grappling with my own questions about the moral teachings of the church, especially as I saw peers grappling with these and sometimes leaving the church because of them. Um, I found myself wondering how and why the moral teaching of the church could be used to justify violent colonization. And I found myself also thinking about Catholic sexual ethics, how those were developed and why. Um, and most importantly, thinking of myself, I was thinking, how can I advance the moral teaching of the church to upend these structures of oppression and injustice that I was seeing? And these questions were what led me to study theology. So coming to the STM, I came into my theological ethics courses with both of these wonderful professors, um, really excited to kind of dive into these questions and kind of chart this path forward for myself. I thought, you know, getting a master's in this, I'll be able to understand it, I'll be able to wield it. But then there are just so many voices. There are so many theologians, so many ethicists, and I easily became overwhelmed with trying to sort through who they were, what they were saying, what the track looked like. Um, and it's here that I found a history of Catholic theological ethics to be just such an incredibly helpful tool for me as I'm developing my theologies and applying theology to other spaces and signs of the times that I'm seeing in my own context and in that of my peers. This text offers a really excellent framework for the progression of the moral tradition, and I found it both concise and nuanced in their, its perspective on the key figures and innovators who are shaping the tradition. As someone studying theology for the first time at the graduate level, this book's an invaluable tool for me as I'm trying to understand how these ethics have developed and how I'm going to shape them. It's helped me understand how these theologians that I encounter across all of my courses are dialoguing with each other and impacting each other, and it, I kind of felt like it was taking this tapestry of moral ethics that I kind of learned throughout my life from being born, growing up in the church, and coming to graduate studies, and turning it over and seeing those threads, kind of weaving everything together and creating this narrative that now I not only see the product, but I understand how it got there. And in the preface of A History of Catholic Theological Ethics, Professor Keenan says that progress is constitutive of the tradition. And through a thorough understanding of the tradition, we're able to innovate and we're able to apply the teachings of this church to more new, new moral spaces. And as graduate students in theology, I think this is the space that we inhabit. Encountering and learning from the tradition through coursework and through discussion, we seek to apply it to new spaces and become the innovators ourselves that maybe the next volume would speak of. And it's only with the guidance of experts such as Professor Keenan that we're really able to gain this understanding and to see that thread coming and how we might fit in it. And I think through this book, Professor Keenan makes his expertise accessible to a much larger audience and also able to be revisited over and over again as the signs of the time shift. So as we're kind of developing into these innovators of the moral tradition, we're kind of living into this modern <coughs> vocation of the moral theologian, which Professor Keenan discusses as being accompaniment. Witnessing suffering and injustice in the world around us, we're standing firm in these truths of our tradition, which we're growing in understanding of through study, but also applying it in new ways to oppose oppression as Jesus did, and standing firm in that idea of weighing everything against the teachings of Jesus. <clears throat> Professor Keenan's framing of this mission of the moral theologian helps me see how the immense tradition of theological ethics can not only take place in these classrooms, book spaces, and graduate work, 
but also outside as practitioners. As I go forth from my theological studies, I'm planning on pursuing a career in educational research with Catholic schools. So I'm venturing outside of the theological space. And I'm focusing on educational equity and culture for culturally and linguistically diverse students. And as I advocate for these students, and I advocate for these culturally responsive and sustaining practices in Catholic schools, I'm going to take Professor Keenan with me, kind of in my pocket, as I carry a history of Catholic theological ethics. It's a tool not only for academic theologians, but also for practitioners seeking to apply church teaching in their own contexts. And this is really important when understanding and countering the arguments of those who are often kind of stemming from a misguided understanding of the moral tradition. So I know that as I'm working to dismantle racist practices in Catholic schools and promote these more liberative educational methods that honor the dignity of each human person in alignment with this teaching, Professor Keenan's book is just going to be an invaluable resource for that. And it's only by understanding this tradition that we're able to innovate. So I'm very grateful to Professor Keenan for inviting us into his classroom through this book as he discusses, and more deeply understanding where we're coming from and where we're going as these leaders in the church. So thank you, Professor Keenan. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Jim, in your, um, in your preface, you speak of this book as being the fruit of your work over many years crafting a narrative of theological ethics for your students. And you actually say you welcome, as Katie said, you welcome the reader into your classroom. Um, I can claim, very luckily, among many others here today, that um, I've, I've also been in that classroom where you, uh, you brought alive the history, sorry, you brought alive the story of our unfolding Catholic moral tradition. Actually, many of the chapters of the book are very familiar. driving <laughs> 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 So I have very good memories in your classroom of being introduced to previously unknown figures, the innovators, those who laid the groundwork for later developments. I'm thinking of particularly people like uh, Vittoria, Las Casas, who I've, I've now come to find very intellectually stimulating for my own work. Or you've introduced me to other figures that I was already familiar with, uh, such as Alphonsus Liguri. I, I'd always had an, an impression of him as being a fairly dull and solemn moralist. So, um, but in the classroom, in the book, You've reanimated him. He's come alive in greater complexity in his creative, his creative engagement with our tradition, um, his engagement that is informed by his pastoral work. I know that through these figures, uh, these three figures in particular, you illustrate your model of theological ethicists, how good moral theology needs both teachers and pastoral companions. So for instance, you write that Victoria and Las Casas needed each other. They needed to inform each other the theologian and the practitioner, needed each other for ethical validation. And likewise, Liguori combines both moral theology with pastoral accompaniment. His moral theology was informed by real moral questions that he came to know through his practical ministry. I, I sometimes notice that at uh, conferences or in discussions with uh, uh, ethicists, you sometimes hear people say that to be an ethicist is to be an activist. You, you have to be an activist to, uh, as an ethicist. This has never really resonated with me. Um, it doesn't seem to capture for me the whole picture of uh, being an ethicist. So I do appreciate this point that you make, that pastoral accompaniment is an integral part of theological ethics. It makes much more sense to me. The model you've offered us shows how a moral the theologian, to use a familiar phrase, must also enter into the chaos of the real <coughs> complex world of people's lives. Moral the theologians must be attuned to historical circumstances. I'm sometimes tempted to wonder that uh, in so many ways, wouldn't our jobs as moral theologians be much easier if we could just parrot our magisterial statements of clearly defined moral teaching, that we could close an argument by saying, this is what the church has always taught, that we could limit our morality to just avoiding sin, rather than growing in holiness, in bothering to love. But of course, your work shows that this would not be authentic to our tradition, nor even helpful to our church. We are instead taking up a living, dynamic tradition, continually, one that continually demands creative engagement in every era. It's a much more typical job. So congratulations on this work, Jim. Uh, you, you've offered to us graduate students here, uh, those of us entering the field, a sense of the story of theological ethics which we are taking up as well as room to imagine how we may also innovate and continue this story. 
Okay, well, it's a tough task to follow all of these panelists, uh, but I will do my best. Um, I'm delighted to comment on Jim's A History of Catholic Theological Ethics. Uh, the book is magisterial in two senses of the word. First, in the common sense, it's comprehensive. It demonstrates great mastery, an insight born of long reflection and practice. But as my fellow panelists have also pointed out, um, it's also magisterial in the original Latin sense of the term, because the word magister means teacher. Jim is a consummate teacher. As anyone who has been his seminar student or colleague knows, Jim teaches in conversation and models for all of us how to teach and learn at the same time. Teaching and learning are not separate activities. They are joined together because we both teach and learn um, from one another. And I think everything that Jim does, from his classroom to CTEWC, models that unity. So I wish I could go on praising the book, but I only have five minutes. So I'd like to engage it on a particular point. I want to focus on something that Jim and I actually have in common fascination with casuistry. In fact, I think I bumped into Jim once at a point while he was working in Princeton, poking around the works of Protestant casuists like William Ames. What is casuistry? Now, you all should know this. There's no test. But since it's late in the afternoon, let me just say that Jim defines it as the method of moral reasoning that incorporates the particularity of a situation and its attendant circumstances through a short narrative description, which today we call a case. Casuistry is analysis of cases in all their particularity, not simply as a cookie cutter um, situation, although sometimes it has been treated like that in the tradition. But Jim distinguishes between rather mechanical exercises of low casuistry, deductive applications of general principle or rules to a very <coughs> schematic view of the facts of the case, from more creative high casuistry, which can reconsider the basis and the scope of the rules in light of the pressures of the factual situations on the analysis. High casuistry goes both ways. Jim emphasizes the creativity made possible by moving inductively rather than merely deductively. He writes, for example, that, quote, in the face of antiquated principles, 16th century ethicists attentive to the newness of contemporary projects as well to the personal struggles of fellow laborers in the field turn for their deliberations to these cases and not to rules or principles. The cases, the situations of people in pain, the situations of people in reality press upon the rules and call for their renovation. So in Jim's view, as in mine, casuistry can be creative. It can be responsible <coughs> to people's needs. It can be positive. But there is trouble ahead. One person doesn't have such a high opinion of casuistry. And that person is not just a person, he's also a fellow Jesuit, and also the Pope. <laughs> Pope Francis has said some rather unflattering things about casuistry over the years, of which I'll just quote two. I can provide more if you'd like. In 2017, Pope Francis observed, quote, casuistry is hypocritical thinking. You can, you cannot. A thought that there can be more subtle, more evil. Up to this point, I can. But from here to there, I cannot. Which is what Pope Francis calls the deception of casuistry. He tells us we must turn from casuistry to truth. And this is the truth, the Pope noted. Jesus does not negotiate truth, ever. He says exactly what it is. Okay, we've got some issues. <laughs> More recently, Pope Francis told a global conference of moral theologians, one that Jim organized, that to reduce moral theology to casuistry is the sin of going back. 
that casuistry has been overcome. Casuistry was my food and the food of my generation and the study of moral theology. But it is proper to decadent Thomism. Now, out, right? Out. <laughs> so, any, my question to Jim is this. Are those of us who appreciate the strengths of casuistry wrong? Are we to be exiled from moral theology? Now, just to be clear, there's no one I'd rather be exiled with from moral theology or anywhere else than with Jim, because he would know all the good hotels and restaurants. <laughs> and he did dedicate his book to me, or not a dedicate, inscribe it as a partner in crime, which honors me greatly. So I'm perfectly happy to go into exile, but nonetheless, home can be good too, especially around the holidays. <laughs> So rather than going into exile today or tomorrow, I want to ask Jim, what does he see as the place of Catholic of casuistry in the Catholic theological ethics tradition going forward? Can it be redeemed from Pope Francis's ire, or do you and I have to pack our bags? <laughs> Thank you. room and I know I think everybody here um, but I'm sure that most of you don't know everybody here um, for instance I, I'm, I'm looking at Calla Maria here I'm in a seminar on uh, with tenure track faculty uh, here and one is from the School of Social Work and one is from the History Department but then there are several people from the History Department like the chair uh, of history and then there's Mark Massa who's hosting this that I'm very grateful for and Maria um, and I'm not a historian, though I wrote a history of it, so I feel very uncomfortable with three historians. <laughs> so you know. Um, but, you know, I, I see John and Mark there, and Tony. Uh, these are people that are uh, basically some of the chief administrators here at BC and running a variety of different offices and services here. That I've been on a seminar with them for quite a while, for about five years. Um, so it's really pleasant to see people coming to engage this book. My colleagues from the theology department, my, my, my brothers from home, um, it's, it's just really welcoming to see uh, students here, colleagues from the theology department, and then, of course, you five. I'm very grateful. I've never met Kate. The only person I've not met in this room before. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is good. Um, so I'm very grateful for your comments and for you coming here. I wrote this basically for you. I, I think that the, I always thought that when I read McBrien's Catholicism, that it was a great book, because at least it had something to refer to. And I felt that in the past 45 years, we've been dependent upon one great book in history, and it was Jack Morney's book. And I felt that that book uh, had defined basically the beginning of moral theology as, as actually steeped in a concern for sin exclusively. And he, he argues this in the first three chapters, that the history of the church is really focused on sin. And the more and more I kept looking at that over this past, say, 15 years, I kept finding that, as a matter of fact, it was based on holiness. That for the most part, people were trying to figure out how to respond to the gospel. And that, as a matter of fact, one thing after, one indicator after another led me to realize that we had to really do a new hermeneutics of understanding the tradition. So for instance, he made this argument because there were a thing called the penitentials, Irish penitentials in the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century. These were about 15 page manuscripts that were used at the different monasteries where nuns and priests, uh, monks and nuns, uh, basically confessed their sins. And these were trying to adjudicate what would be a fair penance for each person. And they were in the, cup, the, in the background of the seven deadly sins. They were, uh, marked out in that way. And if you read them, they're shockingly very particular. It could be that, how much did you drink and did you bop off the host? And if you did, you got about four months of fasting. Um, and, but, so you, he, he, he's looking at these books and saying, see the fascination with sin. The benefit that I had is that after he wrote this, in 80, after he gave these lectures in 81 and then published it in 87, was that there's been a lot of historical research since then. And now we know something about those penitentials. We know from Hugh Connolly, for instance, that as a matter of fact, 
these books were used by what were called anamkara. They, they were called soul friends. Uh, these were people that somebody looked for, a, generally speaking, a nun or a monk, was trying to find a soul friend, somebody who knew suffering. It was always a question about new suffering and knew what it was to be a disciple of Christ and knew that they had to figure out how to proceed and keep going ahead with their own vocation. They were looking for pathways for holiness and they were looking for accompaniment. That's what they were looking for. Adam Kara. This is a tradition that starts in the 6th century. Uh, yes, they used the penitential handbooks to adjudicate when, in the middle of this conversation, they said, oh, and I messed up. And they wanted to do that. But the context, the context of all of this, was the accompaniment, and in a way, the Anankara was not a confessor, but a spiritual director. And it was seeing that, that kept, I kept looking, and looking, and looking, and looking again, um, to see well, what was the early church doing? And then I began to study questions about where did we get the Sunday obligation to go to Mass? Why are we required to worship? And then I began to see that Constantine, for instance, actually is the, one of the first who has a, 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 an obligation to attend the liturgy so as to give a day of rest to the soldiers so that they can participate in the, in the Eucharist that was not accessible to them until he made that a day of rest. So I began to look at uh, all these different ways and see that the tradition was healthier, more alive, and certainly much more positive than the construct that we had had for 40 years. And what Mahani had done was provide us a foundation, but I am now giving a response to that. And I'm thinking of this as a resource for people to see that there was, as Lisa was pointing out, a lot of innovation. I like to show the innovation. But one of the things that Dan had mentioned was that by starting with the Gospels, I'm trying to ask another question that historians don't necessarily have to ask, but often do. And that is, should it have happened? Should it have happened? How do we measure, how do we measure these innovations, as Lisa says? How do we measure them? And it is against the Gospels. It has to be against the Gospel. We have to be asking, is this uh, expression of mercy? Is this the love command in the concrete? Are the works of mercy here evident? Is the Beatitudes being lived? You know, how do we go forward? So that's what I'm constantly looking for. But I'm not looking at for simply in, in teachings. The, the church didn't live by teachings, they lived by practices. That's the way the church lived, was by practices, not by teachings. You know, the, the, they, were do, they, were, they were seeking spiritual direction way before the manuals, the, the penitentials were done. They were looking for the Anakara. They were looking for somebody to work with. And so what I'm always looking for is what are the practices that are going on when there are innovative periods? So for instance, I cannot separate casuistry from the confraternities. You can't do one without the other. Everyone wants to talk about casuistry, but nobody's paying attention to the confraternities. Why is this important? Because the real innovation was not casuistry. It was the confraternities. That way. The 16th century is great for Christianity because of the confraternities. For instance, I'll give you my favorite confraternity, my students all know this, is the Confraternita del Divino Amore, the Confraternity of Divine Love in Italy. 17 confraternities throughout what's today modern Italy. It starts, you know, for one main reason, syphilis. It, it, it breaks out in 1492, you know, this is a famous year, syphilis. You may think Columbus, but syphilis. <laughs> syphilis comes across uh, quite clearly. And the person with syphilis is going to be ostracized by everybody because of the shame of ca carrying the disease, but also because of the contagion of the disease. And, and what the confraternity of divine love did is they set up these ospedali peri incurabili, the hospitals for the incurables. I just saw, uh, uh, Antonio and I were in Venice uh, in early August, and a, a few days before he came, I went to see one of the hospitals of the incurables that was built there in 1517. And the reason why this paint, this print here by Stoney is here, is that's the customs house of Venice, the entry of the port of Venice. And about a hundred yards from there still stands the hospital for the incurables that was built in 1517. This was a mammoth structure that is about, I would say, easily 10 times the size of this building. It is today the center for the Belle Arti. But it, the, these were hospitals that these 
people built in order to take care of those who are most shamed and most likely to die painful deaths. That's what they were doing. In my favorite one of all the hospitals of the incurables is in, um, in Rome. It's right by the entry uh, to the city of Rome, right by the Piazza del Popolo. Mm -hmm. And it's at the church of San Giacomo, St. James, uh, because it's the pilgrim church. And it was there to welcome the people who are on a pilgrimage to see the bodies of Peter and Paul, or to worship at their spaces. And they were on pilgrimage. Oh, what type of pilgrimage were they on? They contracted syphilis. <laughs> you know, if, if, they, if you wanted to ostracize the people, these were the people to do it. And yet, within 400 yards of the entry, they built a hospital there called the uh, Hospitale dei Incudabili. Um, I once went to a store to buy a, a, a print of the Hospitale dei Incudabili. I go into this shop one of those elegant shops where you drop about 150 euros just so you can get a nice little thing and say, hey, it's really cool, it's from the 16th century. It isn't, but anyway. And, 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 and I go in and I go, excuse me, but I'd like to get something from San Giacomo's. And, and she said, she pulls out a picture of the church. And I said, no, mi piace da bere. I'd like the ospedale dei incurabili. I'd like the hospital of the, the incurables. And she goes, ah. And I go, cosa? And she said, sono stato nato là. I was born there. It's an obstetrics. It's a it's an obstetrics hospital today. Today it's still standing. That's how big this place is. This is just one. Alphonsus worked in 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 Alphonsus's time. He worked at a hospital a day in Karabili. This is 200 years later. He's working in one of those hospitals for uh, still the remnants of the uh, of, of of syphilis that's happening. But there were all sorts of other confraternities of accompaniment that we, we can't imagine. We think we're so progressive. You know, we think uh, we're in Boston. We're in Massachusetts, thank God. We think we're, we're really thinking outside the box. Read about the confraternities. The reason why casuistry went further is because human compassion and mercy was tangible and collective and institutionalized. That's why casuistry went ahead. So I'm not interested in just studying casuistry if you're not going to look at the historical context that produced it. And that's why I tried to do the book. I try to say that unless we develop as a people through practices, our teachings don't really matter because the teachings come from the practices. They're expressions of us identifying how we should proceed. And so I try to recast things. Instead of uh, sin, on holiness. Instead about teachings, about practices. But I'm trying to do it in a way that it hasn't been done before. So tonight is really kind of a lot of fun to listen to these different comments. I think I've addressed everything but the last one. So the Pope has to read. He writes it all. He needs to read more. He needs to read. He, thinks he, he doesn't read English, for instance. So it's a, what's the point of giving him an answer? Yeah. But, but I think on the mo notion of casuistry is that, he, and she did, this is a setup. She told me she was going to do this. Um, but, but casuistry, what, what was called casuistry, was simply, for instance, a very famous case is the case of maritime insurance. And it's a case where, um, in the 12th century, uh, one pope said, all, uh, all, uh, in, all, all money lending, all usury is sinful. A maritime insurance is a form of, uh, is a short, a form of, uh, of usury, and therefore maritime insurance is sinful. So it's nice deduct deductive logic, very simple, we, did, we dispatch that. In the 16th century, maritime insurance is unthinkable. Uh, to, to say that you can't do that. I mean, every ship needed maritime insurance. And so they developed a way to be able to talk about how could they do a just maritime insurance, an ethical maritime insurance. They had a, an insight that they wanted to perceive that. And they developed an inductive form of logic in which they used the case to draw a comparison, to see how they could figure out how to go forward, which is what the Pope wants, to go forward, but by using an analogic logic. And, and I think that that's what's really, when we talk about casuistry, we're talking about a full-blown, let's engage everything that's here and try to find morally objective solutions to this, but we do it by analogy and not by deduction. And, and what the Pope is doing is, he's still thinking about his education, but he's not thinking that in 70 years we've been doing this, so I'm going to send him my book. 
and say, if you were to read the history, you would know how wrong you are on the kind of casual street. But you would also see, however, do that too. You would also see, however, that there are some people here that you may want to raise up. And and so the last point I want to make is, everybody's been mentioning Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, when you start reading people, I mean, uh, I see Jim O'Toole here too, uh, more historians here than scaring the hell out of me as I see more and more historians. But when you look at somebody like uh, uh, Alphonsus, Alphonsus I always thought had the most insipid piety going. It just was like, why would I be really interested in him? And yet the more I studied the man, the more fascinating he was. And I just realized that, you know, we can dismiss people if we don't know them, but if we know them, we can't really dismiss them. And there was something about engaging him that suddenly he became, for me, a beacon. Um, he's working in Naples. He, he recognizes among the poor that they have enormous leadership capabilities, and he wants to support them. And he does that through all these evening chapels that he works around, and it's just really fascinating. He works at the Ospedale de Incadabio. He also works for those who are going to be executed, takes care of their families, works with them, and knows that they're in those prisons because of, basically, because of debt. And he's sympathetic to them on that. He, he, he is filled himself with nothing but shame and guilt, and he has enormous, enormous, what do we call them? Um, uh, people who have doubts about everything. Um, scrupulosity. I would like to have that. Uh, he has enormous scruples, but he doesn't. He doesn't allow his scrupulosity to uh, compromise what he knows what the people of God deserve, and that is accompaniment, and that they they deserve not to be given harsh rules, but be be allowed to be empowered so that they can do the ministerial work that they are trying to do in their own particular way. So I think that he's actually a, a model, but if we were just remove, for instance, for a moment, our own biases about what we know and be willing to rediscover what we could know, then maybe doing a second look at the history of moral theology, which is what I'm trying to offer, is something that could bring us to be in a better place. So thank you. I'm delighted. Thank you very much. That you you gonna done this. I'm going to take questions, but I just wanted to thank. Um, <laughs> and, and before uh, before that, I do want to welcome you to this is Hubby House. This is this is where global engagement uh, hangs out. Um, we have 22 people working in this building uh, today. Um, we finally got artwork here. You'll see around the building uh, that it all uh, came. But all of third year abroad the Office of uh, Global Education is here. Adrian Nussbaum, all those, 2,200 people come into the university each year from overseas. All those offices that people go through, that's here, Adrian Nussbaum's office. Uh, Marianne Lockery, uh, who works uh, with JRS and is our liaison with JRS, she has an office here. So we are Global Engagement, and I hope you enjoy uh, the, the place and, and, and walk around and that. But now I'll take questions. Comments, observations. Jim, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, pass it on. I have a very basic question, which is, as a non-Catholic, it kind of surprises me that Jesus is not central to the story of moral theology. I mean, looking at it from the outside, and also having read a lot of Gandhi and reading how he was heavily influenced by the Sermon on the Mount, and by the Gospels and, and his own understanding of morale, of, of construction of Gandhi and moralism. So, what happened to Jesus? Well, on, when I'm on, actually answer? arguing that, it, that, as a matter of fact, in the first few centuries, he's very present. Uh, they're constantly asking the question of how do we follow him. Uh, they're constantly working this out. And so, I'm just doing the first two chapters of the book are really about following in his footsteps, how, how to do that. Uh, and then, and then there's, but then in the later half of the first millennium, there are all these communities that are being formed. And so I'm also trying to look at, well, why is there so much innovation in the 13th century? And I start looking at the models of holiness that emerge in the 12th century. And in the 12th century, there's a lot of uh, spiritual awakening. There are a lot of mystics. They, they, they have a new discovery of, of prayer in which they're encountering 
Uh, the tr and, and, and their encounter of the image of God was of the Trinitarian. We think of it as Christological, that the, we're made in the image of Jesus Christ, but they were thinking of being made in the image of the triune God. And, and, and so they're thinking of Jesus Christ, but they're also thinking of the Spirit, and they're thinking of God as Creator and Father. So th there's a certain way that, as a matter of fact, that is there. Um, later on, we start going, Roman Catholicism goes in one route um, that develops into some of this casuistry, then it goes into the moral manuals, and in a way, it goes into teachings rather than the practices that I've been trying to uh, emphasize. But I think once we get to, back to those practices, we may be able to discern more of what's there. One thing you can say, though, is that with the Reformation, the Protestants clearly say that Jesus and the Gospel are the new norms that we need to be following in everything that we do. So, the, but the Catholics will be talking about a, a natural law tradition that's going to be in terms of these moral manuals that we had from the beginning of the 17th century to the middle of the 20th century. And the Council, in terms of moral theology, is, a, is an occasion to say, can we go back and see what from the tradition we need to retrieve? And on, on that, the ones who really are doing it, the first older scholars, you know, like people like Lotan and Gilman and others, but then people like Lisa, you know, I, I, and the eighth chapter, I begin the eighth chapter by doing for the first time, I don't know if anybody who's done it, because I couldn't find anybody else <laughs> giving me the research, I had to call up people. Who did a dissertation in 1974? Who did a dissertation in 1975, 1976? We're talking about an eight-year period in which we go from no lay person in the field of moral theology ever, right? not before, ever. Uh, and in, in, in 1972, they start appearing. And, and so the first two pages of the eighth chapter, I think, have a, a record of who did this dissertation, and you know, who did a dissertation then and there. And it gives you an idea of how new the lay person's uh, presence in the field is. And th that, that took, as Stan said, that took uh, moral theology into a whole new world in which they were talking about relationship, family life, uh, and, and a variety of other things that under the rubric of marriage was very rarely found. Yeah, and um, Jim, I'm loving this reframing of moral theology as about striving for holiness. And I'm curious if that uh, encourages us to rethink the relationship between moral theology and spirituality. Oh yeah. And if you would like to say something about that. So one of the reform, one of, and Lisa, you, did you know Norbert Vigali? Yeah. So, uh, and can do Norbert Vigali. But there was this guy, Norbert Vigali, who kept, he must have written about 25 articles over the, from 1970 to 1980. Um, we have to do spirituality and moral theology, and he kept trying to get to that. Lotan, this Benedictine, Donald Dovon Lotan from, from uh, Belgium, he too uh, made this appeal, but he made it in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, but it was basically that moral theology had to be integrated. And, and, and what the manuals do, and when you read a manual like Slater's, which is the first English manual in the 20th century, he says that the natural law in moral theology is to avoid evil, um, but not to do the good. He says, read ascetical theology if you want to. So there's a, there's a new moral minimalism in, in moral theology. It's just avoid sin. And, and that, that is not, most people think that was the long-standing tradition. But Lisa's point, that's the bloody innovation of the 20th century, that we, we settled on a new minimalism of it. And so Lotan starts writing, do you know how minimalistic our moral theology is? It's just about avoiding sin. And, and he, he keeps saying, until we understand that the natural law is about avoid evil and do good, until we get to the do good, until we get to the call to discipleship, until we get to forming communities that are responsive about mercy and justice, uh, we're not really going to be doing the moral agenda. And, and I think what happens in the, uh, after the 70s is an attempt to have a much more integrated theological anthropology in which we 
that we put together, the natural law again, about avoid evil but do good. <coughs> and we talk about a moral theology that's alive and is expressed in discipleship. So the term discipleship has very little space when the moral agenda is to avoid evil, to avoid sin. And, and, and so Lotan would write these essays. First he would attack the moralists for writing this stuff. Then he would write against the priest who were insisting on teaching this in the confessional. And then he would go to the laity, why did you buy this bag of goods? <laughs> so he, he didn't let anybody off the hook. And these people were railing, and they were railing because they saw fascism growing throughout Europe. They saw tangibly Catholics acquiescing to all this horror that was breaking out all throughout Europe, just like what we see today. We see today a new minimalism of the faith. And we see not, not real discipleship. We see some sort of new code for what it means to be saved. And it's about <clears throat> abstaining from certain ways of acting, but nothing about what we should be pursuing. So I, 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 there's something really critical there about the separation of the spiritual and the, and the moral. <coughs> In that response, you said the magic word, I thought, confession. <coughs> yeah. uh, and, and in trying to connect this to practice, was, was the success, at least in this country, the success that the church had in getting people to regularly go to confession, <coughs> did it, it just created such demand uh, that you know, there wasn't time uh, for serious moral conversation with lay people in, in particular. Right. I, think, I think that's where your emphasis on, on practice is exactly right. Because how, how, do, how do you train priests? Because you know when they get out there, a large part of what they're going to be doing is listening to confessions. And you've got you to gotta keep that line moving. Right. And, and, and what do you need to do? Get in the state of grace. And the state of grace was simply by avoiding sin. Uh, and, and confessing sin and being absolved, and everything hinged on that. You know, um, uh, Tenkel's book, Sin and Confession on the Eve of the Reformation, I think he really is, is telling us that sin and confession on the Eve of the Reformation was such that people thought that they were just brokering by confessing and not catching what the real gospel that, that he's writing that about the Protestant Reformation. We are doing that in 1940, 1950, 1960. Um, so the Catholic Church is much later in realizing how problematic the issue of the confessional was uh, in, in terms of being the locus for moral training. Because that's what it was. People got their moral training in the confessional. Just a little thing. Uh, the confessional, this is what happens when you live in Rome on occasions. but. Next time you see a confession, see sexual abuse. What is that? That confessional, what is the confessional? It's a box inside the church. What the heck is that all about? So they were confessing not in any place but the pastor's house, the priest's house. They had to get, they had to get the confessing of sins out of the pastor's house. It was all sorts of sexual abuse. The, the confessional is an invention, probably by Barromeo or one of them, uh, in the 16th century. But how can they have confession? Well, it needs to be in a public place, but it needs to be private. So the next time you see a confessional there and you say, what is that all about? It's about you know trying to stop sexual abuse from happening during the, sin, uh, the uh, confessing of sins. So, you know, I mean, a little history can take you far in appreciating why we have certain practices that we have, but then also reminding us how poorly we're doing on uh, quite a number of matters. Yeah. Well, question about the father. As you know, when we were working together, I read a lot of William Ames. And yeah. Do you think that Protestant evangelists did a better job than the Catholics in the 17th century? in terms of navigating the gospel to a specific uh, casuist, I should say. Right. For the Protestant casuists, did they do a better job than the Catholics, in terms of starting with the New Testament and applying it to it? So Edmund Leitz does a, a study of, um, say, on uh, mental reservation. So one of the great problems in the 16th century is, um, you know, 
say, say you're a Jesuit and you've just arrived in England, uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, soldiers are there, and they ask you, are you a priest? And if you say yes, you're going to be killed. Uh, and not only that, but the reason why you went there was to help the recusants who are, who are trying to receive the Eucharist, and you, you're jeopardizing them. So it's not more than just protecting your life, it's also protecting the ministry, and, and their conduit to, to grace. And to, so th then th there was a question, well, what did they, what did they practice? <laughs> uh, but what Edmund Light shows us is that the Lutherans and the Puritans and the Anglicans, so when, when, when James comes to the throne, the Anglicans and the Puritans have the same casuistry that the Jesuits had. That, that as a matter of fact, when it came to Cashier Street, they were doing similar things. We now know, with the distance of history, that the way the Protestants were trying to deal with moral problems was not unlike the way the Catholics were, in terms of strategizing. Where there is a really another interesting thing is that both of them were writing great spirituality at that time. Each of them are writing great spirituality. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, and they're actually sharing the same things. I did an essay about uh, a, 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 a Jesuit whose work was copied. It was actually just pirated uh, by this guy named Bunny. Uh, and, and he sold many more copies than the Jesuit. It was furious uh, all of this. Uh, but it was, this, was, uh, this was the man who basically helped uh, the, uh, uh, the launch of the Spanish Armada uh, against uh, England. Uh, really hated by, by England, and his book was the big spiritual bestseller. They didn't know they were reading him, but it was the big spiritual bestseller that he wrote actually for the recusants, but was being used for people to be, feel confirmed in their faith. So basic instruction, spiritual instruction, spiritual guidance, which was very positive, those books were being shared by both sides. Their works of casuistry they kept hidden, but now history has allowed us to examine those texts and to find out that those two were very similar. Anyway, so there's food, there's beverage, and everything from Mark and from Susie and from Zach. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you very much. book that you can buy for $40 just behind that door. <laughs>